Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. We need to roll back the state. We spy on all of our own citizens. Our prisons are flooded with nonviolent drug offenders. If you want to know who America's next enemy is, look at who we're funding right now. Every single one of these problems are a result of government being way too big. What's up, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of Part of the Problem. I am the libertarian Tupac, the most consistent motherfucker you know, and he is the king of the cocks, Robbie the Fire Bernstein. Monday episode. What's up, brother? I got the right day. How are you living? <laughs> I'm particularly fired up. I, I heard your uh, speech out in Jersey uh, all about unifying the party. It's got me motivated. Well, good, good. I'm glad it did. Yeah, it was a great time. Me and Rob went to the uh, the New Jersey State Libertarian Convention uh, just the other day, uh, and uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Met some really great people. Uh, Scott Horton gave a fantastic speech. I gave a speech as well. Some have described it as it fantastic. Put me up online. It was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all they're all up online. They're up at the um, the New Jersey uh, State Libertarian Party's Facebook page. I know. I don't know where else they might be. I think actually, I think someone posted it on uh, on YouTube as well. So yeah, if you're if you're interested, you can go find that. And yeah, just uh, I, Scott gave a talk about um, basically um, like a synopsis of of his book, um, and uh, he you know gave a talk about all the origins of of the terror wars and basically you know from Carter through uh, present day and and just really fantastic chock full of uh, great information, as tends to be the case when Scott Horton speaks. And um, and I gave a talk on uh, just uh, libertarianism and uh, the, the crises that the, the country is facing at the moment. And then, as you mentioned, I, I talked a bit about, um, you know, libertarian uh, unity. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll start off a little bit just talking about that and, and the state of the Libertarian Party. Um, because obviously, as, as people listening know, I've, I've gotten very involved with the Libertarian Party over the last few years. Um, I really think that it is the, uh, the vehicle with the most potential to help get a libertarian movement energized uh, in, in this country, which desperately needs it right now. And the, I've, I've been you know, particularly involved with the Mises Caucus, and the Libertarian Party has several different caucuses. There's basically like three big ones, and the Mises Caucus is, is one of them. Um, and the, this experiment of the Mises Caucus, which was started by the great Michael Heiss, who is, in my opinion, the most important libertarian activist in the world right now, he started this thing from nothing. Um, and uh, ha has built it up into a force in the party. And so uh, a lot of people were, um, were, were really motivated to, uh, to jump into this fight um, because of it, it, the origins really started in the, uh, in the 2016 presidential election. Um, this was when a lot of people, uh, myself included, started looking at the Libertarian Party and more or less my my thoughts uh on the libertarian party then and now were were basically this i when ron paul was running for president in 2008 and in 2012 this is what got a lot of people excited about libertarianism and this is how i found this whole philosophy that is now uh shaped my entire life um and uh ron, people used to ask ron paul all the time oftentimes snarky reporters would ask Ron Paul, well, why are why aren't you running as a libertarian? Like you're not a Republican in the sense that George W. Bush is a Republican, right? And you're really a libertarian. So why are you running as a Republican? And Ron Paul, I, I think um, fairly uh, would claim to be the most conservative member, uh, which I, I think is is you know, I, I mean, it all depends on how you define these things. But he would say, like, look, if you look at everything that I stand for, it's basically the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. So what's more conservative than that in America? What what could be more conservative than saying, I support our founding documents, right? And and of course, he was, uh, he would accurately point out that he has voted against more spending and, and you know, uh, waste in government than any other Republican ever. 
So isn't he the most conservative? Now, of course, other people can define conservative as, you know, wanting to bomb the crap out of Iran, and then I guess he's not. But that, to me, seemed like a reasonable definition. But the answer he would give of why he wasn't in the Libertarian Party was simply that they had rigged all the rules against third parties. And he'd be like, that's just, that's the way it is. And I remember hearing Ron Paul say this in 2008, and that was just, that was it for me. I was like, yeah, he's right. Why, why join another party if the rules are rigged against you? You'd have to join either the Republicans or the Democrats, and then you can get on the debate stage, and then you can talk to the American people. Um, but, you know, we're now in 2021. It's not 2008 anymore. Things have changed drastically. I mean, the, the internet compared to today was kind of in its infancy. In, in 2008, social media was in its infancy. There was, if you were looking for a podcast that had triple the size of the biggest show on cable news, that didn't exist in 2008. There was no, you needed the, the corporate press coverage. You needed the debate stages. You needed all these things. It made sense at the time. Um, in 2016, when Ron Paul had retired, and Rand Paul's uh, presidential campaign, let's just say, didn't work out um, for a lot of reasons that we could get into some other time. What, what you were left with was Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, the two campaigns with the highest negatives in the history of polling negatives of candidates. And, um, and then you had this third party that's just sitting there that bears the name libertarian, that has ballot access in all 50 states. And all of the sudden, you realize like, you know, at least I did, and I think a lot of other people did, that we'd look at this thing and go, oh, you know, maybe we were too quick to dismiss the idea that the, a third party could be the vehicle that spreads liberty. And at the same time, as I was alluding to a second ago, the landscape changed. And now all of a sudden, you know, okay, well, maybe Gary Johnson wasn't allowed on uh, Gary Johnson was the candidate in 2016. Maybe he was wasn't allowed on the debate stages. But he was on Rogan's podcast. He was on he could get on like all these huge shows. And so he could speak to the American people right there, which is all this is all, uh, all been about to me, conveying this message to the American people, you know, speaking to the remnant. And it, so so people started looking at this and going, Oh, okay, well, maybe there's really something to this. And in this moment, the Libertarian Party decided to run Gary Johnson along with Bill Weld, who, you know, they were now Gary Johnson was a good libertarian, but he was just utterly unprepared for the moment. And Bill Weld was just not a libertarian. He was a war hawk, Raytheon lobbyist who ended up supporting Hillary Clinton. And uh, um, this made a lot of libertarians furious, a whole lot of other things as well. But this really made them furious. And uh, this is this was around the time of the origin of the Mises Caucus. And the idea was to say, look, we want we want to bring the liberty movement into the Libertarian Party and actually stand for true libertarianism, Austrian economic, uh, Austrian uh, economics, um, anti intervention, uh, um, you know, like the real hardcore libertarian shit. And um, and it started as a very small thing. And Michael Heiss built it up and he recruited myself and Tom Woods and Scott Horton and all of these other, you know, like figures in the liberty movement to say, yeah, let's focus our energy here on the Libertarian Party. And right around the same time, uh, the, the former chair of the party, Nick Sarwak, um, really attacked the Mises Caucus and then started going out of his way to attack everybody at the Mises Institute, Tom Woods, Ron Paul, myself, a whole lot of other people. And he became almost like the symbol of what the Mises Caucus was fighting against, was fighting against, uh, you know, this type of leadership in the Libertarian Party. Well, since then, uh, um, to now, you know, I've, I've gotten more and more active in the party, and really been pushing it harder and harder. And I'm speaking at conventions now and having events and, and all of this stuff. And the Mises Caucus has just been working their asses off just working their asses off and growing and recruiting and fundraising and helping candidates uh, on every level. Um, and of course, obviously, we don't need to relive all of it. But they're the, in the 2020 campaign, uh, me and you, Rob, had some uh, differences of opinion with the way the, uh, the campaign was run. Um, and after it, in, in the aftermath, 
we really doubled down on our, our efforts in the Libertarian Party. Now, the other day, uh, there, there were some state conventions, and the Mises Caucus just had an incredible amount of success, just an incredible amount of success, um, to the point that uh, Nick Sarwak, who, who was the chair um, of the National Party, um, uh, you guys might remember him from, I did a Soho Forum debate with him and then debated him on the podcast. And since those debates and since the Mises Caucus influence has been growing, um, he hasn't won anything in the party. Um, he's, he, he didn't stand again for, for re-election and he, uh, um, and, and he went and ran for a position in New Hampshire and he ran and, and his, uh, opponent, um, had to, uh, pull out or his opponent was ineligible or something like that. I think the rules are you have to be a lifetime member for a certain amount of years and he had only been it for not as long or whatever. Um, so he ran against none of the above. Uh, for a, a small local, you know, like a, or a state position, and he lost to none of the above. Um, it, it's just I, I just mention it to demonstrate how much our influence has grown in the party. And uh, on the other hand, you know, like what, what you were mentioning when I, I've been talking about all this unity stuff is that for a while, I think the Mises Caucus was just getting viciously attacked and fighting back against the people who were attacking us. But as I've gotten more involved in the party, I've realized that there are just so many good people in the party. And so it's fine to defend ourselves against those people, but we are winning those battles. And what I'm more focused on now is trying to work with all of the other really good people in the party. So that's kind of the spirit of unity. And I, I even said something uh, um, you know, nice about Nick Sarwak uh, on Twitter the other day, and he responded back with something kind of shitty, but whatever, who cares, you know? Um, it's it's irrelevant. He lost, you know, and we had huge wins. And um, I think that, uh, you know, that basically the only reason I mentioned this at all on the show is because there were a lot of people, uh, a lot of people joined the Libertarian Party along with me, and we're all kind of doing this together. And a lot of other people said, well, I'm not going to join as long as that Sarwak guy is there. So now I'm holding you to it. Now's your time to join uh, because we, we, you know, won that battle. Um, and so that's, uh, I, I use this purely as a recruiting tool. Uh, you, you, uh, I can't enforce this, but if you said that uh, you would join the party once we got rid of this guy, well, now you have to join the party. Again, I can't enforce it, but Marley, I'm going to hold you to that. You join, you join the party now. And um, I, I, I'm telling you, over the next year, some just incredible things are going to happen in the Libertarian Party. I'm so excited about them. And it's it's really right now all centered around Angela McArdle becoming the national chair. Uh, she is just fantastic, just a great Libertarian. Uh, I was listening to her speech the other day. She's just she's everything you would want the Libertarian chair to be. Just smart, um, uh, really knows her stuff, is fearless, demonstrates courage, just everything you would want a great libertarian to be. So I'm like enthusiastically supporting her. And um, anyway, so yeah, my speech the other day was just all about how, you know, we're, we're living through a moment where the government has gone completely totalitarian and we need as many good libertarians uh, to get together and really fight against this shit. Because we've got like, you know, a, a nation on a goddamn suicide mission right now. And um, we've got a lot of the answers to try to, uh, to try to correct course. So anyway, uh, the Libertarian Party uh, is uh, this is where it's at. There's still uh, there, there's still some people there who are uh, working against us. But overwhelmingly, um, the um, the the shakeup of the Libertarian Party to make it something just incredible and meaningful and impactful is is going better than any of us could have possibly predicted it would. So get on board with it now. So you can be a part of uh, all the fun shit that's going to happen over the next year. And uh, I think Rob got some sandwiches or something. I don't know. I Didn't was you? snacking. They had he seltzer cans. I had some fun in the corner. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, it's a, it, was a, it was a fun group. Um, all right, guys, let's take a quick second and thank our sponsor for today's show, a brand new sponsor who we're thrilled to have on board, and that is SA Company. When you spend a lot of time in the great outdoors, you'll find out pretty quickly that Mother Nature doesn't always play nice. SA Company has all the protective gear you need to brave the elements and explore more every day. Like the multi-use face shields, they're UPF 30, lightweight and breathable. 
the perfect piece of protective gear for your next adventure. The pandemic has uh, kept a lot of people sitting at home, but the best thing you can do for your mental health is to get outside, get in the sun, go for a hike, go hunting, fishing, skiing, riding or biking. But if you're doing all those things, you might need some protection and that's where SA face shields come in. They offer breathable protection from everything the outdoors throws at you. Sun, wind, cold, insects, dust, dirt, moisture, one size fits all. They're machine washable and they come with a lifetime warranty so there is zero risk. SA believes in giving back to the men and women who are putting themselves on the front line every day through their partner with Operation Gratitude. They've donated well over 100,000 face shields to those on the front lines of the pandemic. For every order, SA donates one face shield to a first responder, so you can get a great deal on an incredible product, plus a chance to give back. Stay protected outdoors, because right now you can get an insane deal. Buy one, get four free. It's $150 value for only $24.99. Just go to safishing.com slash POTP and get five face shields for the price of one, plus a lifetime warranty and free returns if you're not satisfied. That's safishing.com slash P-O-T-P for that fantastic deal. Go enjoy the great outdoors and uh, keep yourself protected while you do it. Safishing.com slash P-O-T-P. All right, let's get back into the show. All right, so anyway, let's talk, uh, let, let's talk about some news of the day. Um, so one thing that's kind of been on my mind that I've been seeing uh, everywhere, uh, th this story is real, or, or this... I don't know. It's not one individual story, but this narrative has been uh, um, very widely discussed, and that is the rise in violence toward Asian Americans. Um, pretty much everywhere, anywhere you you look or read or surf the web, this is a this is a, a big thread that's going on right now. Um, violence against Asian Americans, and pretty much the narrative from the establishment is that obviously this is all Donald Trump's fault. Uh, of course, because everything has to be. And um, yeah, this is it, it, it. This seems to be something that people are talking about a lot. I'm sure you've seen uh, a bit of this, Rob. Well, apparently there's scattered incidents, which I, I, I can't speak to because uh, I can't tell to what extent they're just trying to report on mm -hmm. something that isn't a major issue. So I don't know. But the big one that was in the news last week was there was an incident in Atlanta where uh, a kid basically keeps going to the, uh, you know, the handy places, getting the massage parlors, and uh, he can't resist the Asians, so he decides he has to go kill them. He needs to rid the earth of the Asian prostitutes who are working at these handy, you know, <laughs> these fine organizations I've never giving heard, out uh, hand heard them jobs. Referred to as the handy places before. It sounds like where, uh, where you'd get a plumber or something like that. But uh, well, I don't think that's maybe, what you're talking about. Maybe they should rebrand. You know, they're just as much that as they are, um, you know, massage parlors or whatever. So, anyways. Kid, he can't he can't handle the Asian temptation, so he decides he's going to go in there. And as a good Christian man, he's going to rid the earth of these prostitutes. Uh, and then you know they take him in for you know they arrest him, and he says that he wanted to get rid of prostitutes. Uh, and six out of the eight were Asians; the other two were not. And now they're just reporting about how this is a uh, clear incident of you know Asian violence. It's got nothing to do. Yeah. They're not even talking about the hook ring. Yeah, right. Which is it, it, it seems in many of these cases that the kind of um, race obsessed hucksters are, are just trying their absolute best to make this a racial narrative when it doesn't seem clear that that's what's going on here. Um, and it's, you know, it, I, I think sometimes uh, sometimes there, there's some kind of dishonest people. Uh, involved in these. And then there's an audience of sometimes not dishonest people, um, but people who have, I think, too much of a simplistic uh, uh, worldview, where you'll be like, well, look, but we're against it. This is bad. This is awful what happened. So let's be against it. And if we're against it by saying it's racist, then fine. You know, like, at least we're not, I don't know, at least we're calling attention to the issue. But much like I, I was, uh, um, I, I've been saying for the last year, with the Black Lives Matter um, uh, protests, you know, if if you're going to label, um, you know, uh, uh, events as racist attacks, you really should have some evidence that this actually had something to do with race. 
Because if not, and you're putting all of your focus and, and attention on the racial aspect of it, and if that's wrong, then you're not going to properly understand what's going on, and then you're you're going to have a far um, a far smaller chance of actually solving the problem. So as, as I've said before, I mean, I think you know what happened to George Floyd was just terrible, and I think what happened to Breonna Taylor was just terrible. But in neither incident have I seen one shred of evidence that race had anything to do with it. I, again, as I've said before, I'm open to the evidence, still open to the evidence. I've been saying this for a year. Nobody has sent me one shred of evidence that suggests that either of them had anything to do with race. Um, aggressive policing, um, the war on drugs, perhaps no knock raids, you know, being uh, okay. Poor. Huh? Just being poor. Yeah. Uh, right. Possibly. Um, but that's very different than, you know, a, a racial uh, incident. And, and the truth is that you can like, you know, um, uh, Duncan Lemp was, was murdered by the police, uh, I think right around the same time as, as, as Breonna Taylor. And, um, and, and, you know, they're in a very similar type thing, right? And so it's not as if there's like evidence like, oh, they don't do this to white people. They only do this to black people. It seems to me like the, the center of the problem is, you know, the, the, the police state in this country. And so that, again, it's just like if you're not going to address that and you get distracted by all this other narrative, then that's just not going to help. Now, if it is true that there is a trend of targeting uh, of targeting Asian people in this country, then that would be worth discussing. But it's so hard with the the like kind of dishonest, race obsessed press keeps pushing this narrative, and you're like, wait, but what's actually going on here? I understand that you want this narrative that Donald Trump called it the Wuhan virus, and that's why you know uh, th that's why all these people are going out now, a year later, and and assaulting Asians or something like that. Um, but that doesn't seem even remotely accurate. So is the, if this is just for political uh, uh, expediency, then we're, we're not going to solve any of the real problem that's going on. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah. All right. I think it, also, I, I, I don't know, aside from the Atlanta incident, have you seen real cases of, uh, um, an uptick, I guess, in crime against Asians? Well, look, I, got, like, is, I mean, is it really going on nationwide or is there scattered incidents? Because, well, listen, this is uh, uh, it, there does seem to be somewhat of an uptick in uh, violence against Asians, although their violent crime has gone up all around. And from what I've I've been able to see uh, 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 trying to just look at the data, it seems that um, there is an uptick in violence against Asians, particularly, but that. The demographic who are committing the crimes are, let's say, not white male Trump supporters. Okay, and so it seems like this could be um, a, a matter of uh, there could be other factors involved here, like the fact that there's a lot of Asian store owners in high crime areas that are, um, you know, becoming victims of crimes. And perhaps the fact that they're not part of the racial demographic of that group is leading toward them of those neighborhoods. Maybe that is leading toward them being targeted. I don't know. But so I, I got this New York Times article. But um, if that, by the way, if that's true, so then uh, suppressing Trump supporters or calling them domestic terrorism or trying to police the Internet to make sure that Trump supporters aren't sharing information probably won't do anything to affect the violence against Asian Americans. Probably not. Yes, that probably won't solve the problem. Well, here, I got this New York Times article because uh, they've been writing a bunch about this as well as just about every other uh, major news outlet. And, and the title is Asian Americans are being attacked. Why are hate crime charges so rare? So um, uh, and then the subtitle is uh, several recent attacks have not been charged as hate crimes, fueling protest and outrage amongst many Asian Americans. So this is there is any reason for a hate crime? I mean, well, to have I, that yeah. delegation whatsoever, like, like if you punch me in the face because I'm Jewish, you punch me in the face. That's the crime. It doesn't yes. matter why you can punch someone in the face because you wanted to punch them in the face because you thought their face looked stupid. You thought they looked Jewish. They said something. It doesn't matter. The crime is the crime. I don't get why. Uh, yes, I, I think I could sum up your point by saying hate crime laws are stupid. 
Um, but more than stupid, I actually think, and, and I think as a, a libertarian and as a just thinking person, I think there's something profoundly wrong with the idea of hate crime legislation. Um, and that there, there really is something embedded in the idea of, of a hate crime um, carrying some type of extra weight than a normal crime that really misses the point and, and speaks to one of the biggest problems in our society, um, which I've, I've, you know, has been a central theme of mine for just years on this show, one of the most central themes, that we have a, just a, a, a profoundly toxic problem with priorities uh, of moral outrage in this country. And I said, I, I forget what show I was on um, the other day. Maybe it was on Reed Coverdale's show, or maybe it was on Liberty Lockdown. It was on one of those shows, I think. Or maybe, yeah, I can't even remember. I do too many of these goddamn shows. Uh, but I, I said, you know, that, that I just gave the example. I go, well, look, if, if Joe Biden were to uh, bomb a third world country tomorrow and kill 100 innocent people, you know, wh whatever the country would be, you know, pick a country that he wants to bomb, maybe Iran or Syria or Iraq or Yemen or, you know, the, who, who the hell knows. Uh, so he bombs one of these countries, kills 100 innocent people. And the same day, Joe Biden said in a press conference, uh, I, I believe trans women are not women. We all know what the story of the day would be, where all of the outrage would go. Is the hundred innocent people who died would be like a footnote. You know, there'd be an article here or there about it, but it wouldn't really be what people are talking about. But we would obsess back and forth over the trans stuff, you know? And and that feel however you do about that issue. If you're a libertarian, you have to recognize that's that's kind of a problem where our priorities lie. Now you can feel that trans women are women, or you can feel that they're not, but the fact that one person has an opinion on it should not be more of an outrage than a hundred innocent people dying. And I think it, it'd be hard for anyone to argue with me that that wouldn't be more of the story of the day if both those things happened on the same day. So the problem, the real fundamental problem with hate crime laws is that they start from a, a philosophical framework that, that uh, believes that a racist murderer is worse than a murderer. And, and I think to, to uh, most rational people, there should be something a little bit off about that. Because like being a racist is, is let's say bad, okay? Being a murderer is like evil. And it, it, it's almost like, you know what I mean? Like the idea that you'd be like, this guy was a murderer. Plus he was a jerk about it. <laughs> like what, why are we even talking about that? He was a jerk about it. We are so far beyond that. You know what I mean? And, and like you said, I mean, if somebody punched you in the face cause you were Jewish or if they punched you in the face cause they just didn't like your face or because they didn't like your shirt or because whatever, they didn't like your politics or they didn't like your, all of these to me are the exact same crime the exact same level of immorality. I, I just don't see uh, how, how you could, you know, um, successfully argue against that. So it's almost like you're hijacking murder crimes as a way to push your agenda for right. general fairness or that we feel like every, but murder is really important. So maybe there's other avenues that you can use for that. And like you were saying, if we just speak to the principle of let's not have crimes, like crime is the issue or violence is the issue, we might actually be able to do a better job of working against it. Yes. And and oftentimes what it right. So so that what, what I first mentioned was kind of like the philosophical issue with it. But I think what you're getting at is more of the, just the practical issue is that now you, it, it allows people to um, – to kind of grift off of this race obsessed shit and distract from what the real issue is. Also, the truth is that uh, so many times these things become like it's, it, you know, when a violent crime is being committed, odds are you're not saying nice things to that person. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so now if you're not saying nice things to those person, but you mention their race, we're, we're making this some other crime. And now we're going to paint the narrative that what's going on here is racism. And that's the root of the problem. And it's not always clear that that is what's happening. You know what I mean? Like I've seen, uh, just as, uh, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, I've seen people, uh, get assaulted before and their race get brought up. 
while they were being assaulted. Like, you know, um, it, it, I've seen a group of black kids beating up a white kid and scream like white boy while they're beating them up. And I've seen vice versa. And I've seen, you know what I mean? Like, and, so, and you know, it, it's not clear exactly that racism was the root of the problem. There, there were other problems that happened that led to this violent attack. And ultimately, the problem is that it was a violent attack. They assaulted somebody. Um, but the truth is, once you're in a fight or once you're beating somebody up, yeah, you're probably not saying, hey, great shirt, you know, like you're saying something uh, angry, hateful, right? Um, so it's just, it's very easy for people to then manipulate this and, and you kind of miss the whole point of what's going on. But just to get back to this New York Times article, I'll read the title one more time. And I'm not going to read through the whole thing. You guys feel free to go uh, read it on your own if you want. But so they say Asian Americans are being attacked. Why are hate crime charges so rare? Okay. So now there's this is already being presented in a way, right? Let's so forget the fact that hate crimes, the, the idea are, are stupid. The, the idea of charging someone with a hate crime. You should charge them with the attack. That's the crime. And, and there's also, by the way, one more thought that I didn't, uh, uh, one more point that I didn't add into this is the other thing that's dangerous about hate crime charges is that you, you are veering into the world, at least in a philosophical sense, of thought crime. And okay, you can even say that, well, it's, it, you know, it, it was obviously a violent crime that was committed, but you're charging them with the violent crime plus the thought crime. That's really what you're doing with a hate crime. You're saying you're guilty of an assault plus thinking mean things while you assaulted him. And there's something about that that I, I find very creepy. Um, but so if you put a title this way, Asian Americans are being attacked, why are hate crime charges so rare? Well, what is that already, what, what do, does this allow the wheels to turn and start to think? What are, what are they pushing you toward here? Huh, there are these hate crimes and they're not being charged as hate crimes. Like, what's going on here? Why are they so rare? Several recent attacks have not been charged as hate crimes, fueling protest and outrage amongst many Asian Americans. Now, again, this is all trickery of words. Outrage by many Asian Americans. Well, what does that even mean? Many? How many did you? How, how many are outraged about this? There, there, it's not like there's some, some data point here that says the majority of Asian Americans are outraged about this, or even that a large number. But you can just say many, you know? And we know this in, in kind of like the cancel culture world. There's that people are outraged, are they? You know, you, if you uh, uh, do a show for 400 people and, and, you know, 396 of them are just laughing their ass off and four of them are offended, they can write, people are offended. But what is that actually? It, I'm just saying it's, it's just a, a, like, it's not necessarily the most accurate representation, necessarily. It, it might be. But of course, now you start going in this direction, right? Well, there are these racist attacks and they're not being charged as hate crimes and Asian Americans are being targeted. And oh, by the way, they're outraged about this because they're not being charged as, as hate crimes. But look, these hate crime laws are on the books. Prosecutors are incentivized to prosecute these crimes, right? They want to rack up the, their own record and get more people in jail. So what's another explanation for why they're not being charged as hate crimes? There's no evidence. That's the other thing. So here we go, right? Um, uh, so he, reading from the, um, uh, uh, the article, on a cold uh, evening last month, a Chinese man was walking home near Manhattan's Chinatown when a stranger suddenly ran up behind him and plunged a knife into his back. So horrible story. You know, um, this random guy just stabs this, this Chinese guy. For many Asian Americans, the stabbing was horrifying, but not surprising. It was widely seen as just the latest example of racially targeted violence against Asians during the pandemic. But the perpetrator, a 23-year-old man from Yemen, okay, had not said a word to the victim before the attack, investigators said. Prosecutors determined they lacked enough evidence to prove a racist motive. So... Just even when you start getting into some of the details of this story, and that's just one right there, it's like they start with, oh, the, you know, like the, the Asian community is outraged that these hate crimes aren't being charged. This has been, you know, there's been increased violence against Asians during the pandemic, kind of implying that, that because people are mad about COVID coming from China and wink, wink, because Donald Trump is such a jerk, 
people are committing violent crimes against Asians, except that what you see here is that some crazy Yemeni dude just stabbed a guy and no one had any clue what his motivation here was. So there's just, again, it's like, like I was saying with the Black Lives Matter stuff, if we wanna be serious adults about this and decent people who obviously recognize that's really awful that some random innocent guy got stabbed, but there's no evidence at all in this case that suggests that him being Asian had anything to do with it. It seems kind of like a crazy person stabbed a person. So this is just one example, it, 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 you know, but it's being cited in this article here. And so now they're, they're, they're going to be, you know, outraged against the cops that they're not charging them with a hate crime. And they're like, what, what can we go off here? Like there's no, there's no clear racial motivation at all. And, and, you know, um, so, so the issue, right, becomes if the, and I really don't know what the answer to this is, right? Is it true that crime against Asians has increased because people are angry about uh, COVID coming from China? That's possible. I'm not dismissing that. But it's also possible that crime in general has gone up over the last year. In fact, it's a fact that crime has gone up very high, particularly in cities across the country um, over the last year. And that lots of factors uh, uh, are, are a part of that. There's there's many different factors that go into that. There's the lockdowns and the economy. There's the the police and the protests and the riots and all types of different things that have been factors on the general crime level. Um, and so it's not, again, it's like if you're just taking a case like this, well, this doesn't suggest any evidence at all that this had anything to do with them being Asian. And then you take a case like um, the, the one that you just brought up in Atlanta before, this the one that got a lot of national attention. There's no evidence at all that this was like uh, uh, targeted against Asians. It seemed to be targeted against um, prostitution or massages with happy endings or, or whatever. Again, to the point that we made before about hate crimes, it's all just as bad. It's not that one is better or worse than the other one. It's just that you want to understand what's actually happening in reality if you want to have any chance of uh, of improving the situation. I make a great funeral. Uh, it's a tragedy. She had soft, delicate hands, and there were 10 years of more hand jobs left in those hands. That's what he took from society. <laughs> oh, shit. But I just hate, I uh, I really do, I, I hate the kind of like race-obsessed um, reporters who play off this shit and try to paint narratives. And then, of course, like there's several more levels. Um, like it, it's not, first off, it would have to be clear that people are attacking Asian people because they're Asian. And then it would have to be made clear that they were attacking them because they're Asian, because they're angry about covid you know, coming from from China. And then it would have to be made clear that they're doing that and more likely to do that because Trump called it the Wuhan virus rather than, you know, the coronavirus. And that is such a stretch. I mean, like, it'd be so hard to actually, you know, have any evidence to point to that direct line. You know what I mean? And, um, but of course, they just jumped to it. Like so many people just jump to it like it's a given, but it's not at all a given. And particularly, like, are we supposed to say because some Christian who was, you know, um, like a sex addict and was fear? I mean, this sounds like a crazy person, right? That's what it sounds like. It doesn't sound to me like this. Like, think about how crazy of a person you'd have to be to go kill a bunch of uh, happy ending massage parlor workers. Um because you, you know, you think that they're tempting you and they're, you know, blasphemous against Christ or whatever his own, you know, that you're, you're this is a, a crazy person. So you're telling me that that person, if Donald Trump had just said <laughs> COVID instead of Wuhan, that that would have been enough to like pull him off the, I mean, like when you actually start thinking about it, this is like beyond absurd. And yet it's being presented by the supposed adults in the room as like a very plausible, if not damn near obvious explanation for what's happening. And I'm sorry, I do not believe that this Yemeni man in, in Chinatown stabbed someone because of what Trump said last year. I just don't believe that. And um, it's uh, it, it seems that the, the corporate press is getting more and more desperate 
in their attempts to paint, you know, uh, anything that's happening today as the fault of Trump. So Biden gave a speech about this recently and basically uh, agreed with the whole thing. You know, the problem is really that we just have to demonstrate sensitivity from a presidential level. I'm sorry, I don't believe that people are out there committing murders and horrific crimes because of something the last president said a year ago. I just, I, I don't believe that. Or to be fair, he didn't say, I mean, I guess he keeps saying it, but, uh, but I, I just don't believe that there's a connection there. Again, like I said with the, uh, with the Black Lives Matter stuff, I really am I, I, not just saying this, I'm open to evidence. If someone sends me evidence, then I would, I would gladly, uh, you know, take a look at it. But I haven't seen any so far. And so I'm not just going to go along with this narrative because it is politically expedient for Democrats. Um, sorry. All right, guys, let's take a moment and thank our sponsor, a brand new sponsor to this show who I'm thrilled to have on board, and that is Coastal. If you need to buy glasses, try buying them from Coastal online. Coastal sells glasses online. Now, a lot of people are a little bit hesitant to buy glasses online because you're worried how they'll actually look. But Coastal makes it so easy. You browse and virtually try on hundreds of frames without having to leave your couch. I just tried this the other day. Everyone in my family besides me wears glasses. My mother, my sister, my brother, they all wear glasses. And I was trying this the other day and it's really cool. You can actually try them on online. You see exactly how the frames look on your face. And at Coastal.com, you can get prescription glasses starting at $9 with free shipping and a 60-day risk-free return. So you can get unbelievably affordable frames. You can return them within 60 days so there's no risk. You can see how they look before you order them. It's really incredible. I mean, glasses can be very expensive. And if you do it this way, you don't have to leave your house. You don't have to go to the store. You can save some money and you can see exactly how they look on you. With Coastal, you don't have to spend hours at the store and spend hundreds of dollars to get a new style. You just go to coastal.com, pick the frames you want, enter your prescription details, and your glasses will arrive in just a few days. Coastal has over 2,000 frames to choose from and 24-hour customer support. That's why Newsweek called it America's best customer service. And when you buy a pair from Coastal, you can donate a pair to someone in need in just one click at no extra cost. To date, Coastal has given more than 500,000 pairs of glasses to people in need across the world. And like I said, they're starting at just $9. No need to leave the sofa, get a new pair of glasses for a really great price. This is the new way to shop for glasses, Coastal.com. And right now for a limited time, they're offering our listeners the best deal they have going anywhere. 30% off your first pair of glasses at coastal.com slash P-O-T-P. Get free shipping, 60-day risk-free returns, and 30% off at coastal.com slash P-O-T-P. Discount applied at checkout only for a limited time. That's C-O-A-S-T-A-L dot com slash P-O-T-P. Some restrictions apply. Go check this website out. This is going to be the future of how people buy eyeglasses. It's pretty incredible. Coastal.com slash P-O-T-P. All right, let's get back into the show. Anyway, uh, let's change gears a little bit. Speaking of a narrative that is not so politically expedient for Democrats, remember when Donald Trump was such a monster uh, because he had kids in cages, Rob? You familiar? It was a few years ago, remember? Donald Trump had kids in cages, and this was like the worst thing in the world. Um, and by the way, it is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, but it looks like uh, Joe Biden has not freed the children. I know you've been keeping up with this story a little bit. Why hasn't he freed the children, Rob? Well, because it's a disaster on the border. They've got more people trying to cross in than ever. Uh, he changed some of the policies that I guess Trump had in place. I think the biggest one is uh, did, like where you declare amnesty and that whether or not you have to do it in your home country, among some other things. And now he's got more kids than he can deal with. And uh, because we don't live in a free country, he's trying to keep the press out because he doesn't want any bad press or any of the pictures about how they're mistreating kids because they want to pretend like there's infinite resources. We can afford to take care of any available problem. Uh, and so obviously we can be humanitarians in every single circumstance that could ever possibly arise. La La Land. Yeah, it's um, it's it's really something to uh um see you know the the kind of immediate change 
it's really you know it's like with the immediate change from campaign into uh um you know administration and how now all of a sudden it's like well the uh, so many lines that came out of the trump administration are now coming out of the biden administration about uh, uh this whole thing but the one that really stuck out to me and you actually sent me the video of it was a uh, uh, biden's border uh, security guy you know being asked well why can't the press come in and see why can't we see and he goes we're in the middle of a pandemic we're in the middle of a pandemic i mean we have cameras in pretty much everywhere yet cameras just can't come into these border facilities because i mean you just so you know covid covid and the thought is really amazing how much they will just use covid as an excuse for what is obviously just covering up you know what is a scandal from from the administration um i also love the we're trying to do everything we can to make access available which means we're trying to clean up the mess so that no one sees the mess yep that's exactly right. That's that is exactly what is really start going start shipping on the kids down to Gitmo, keep five behind, put them up with a nice TV and a couch and go, look, we, we got nice TVs and couches for these kids. Yeah, I mean, it really is just it, it's awful. And it's it's really heartbreaking um, that uh, the, the pictures that came out that I guess were from Project Veritas got some pictures uh, from some of the facilities out. And it's just I mean, if you can imagine, right. Like try to imagine, you know, kids being detained, it, it, you know, in these, uh, uh, you know, in, in these jails and now plus with the COVID shit. So they got them all masked up and, and plastic, you know, uh, walled in and they got, you know, it's just, it's awful. It's like, what an awful, uh, uh, situation for children to be in, but it really just isn't clear that there's, um, that there's an easy solution for this and well, for, all of the grandstanding uh, of the Democrats, I've, I've yet to hear anybody come up and say, this is what we need to do. Then you can say, it's easy to just say, release the kids. But the problem with releasing kids is like, release them to who? In whose custody? Because a lot of these kids are not accompanied by their parents. In fact, the number of unaccompanied children has been skyrocketing. So you need to know where to release. You can't just release children into the, into the streets. You know what I mean? Like you have to have some type of plan for this. And the more that you, um, you know, the, the, if you just grant them all uh, uh, amnesty or citizenship or something like that, then you're going to get a lot more kids coming. Um, and, and as bad as being held in the facilities uh, is, the, the journey from, from their country to here is, is probably far worse. And you don't exactly want to incentivize more kids to come unaccompanied uh, uh, on that journey. I think uh, government's playing a losing game where they're trying to protect us from the uh, harshness of our reality. And if they didn't do that, people would actually make changes in their lives, take personal responsibility. And even in this case, they, people might uh, more see the privilege that they have of being able to live in this country and even just having the economic opportunities that these other people don't. But as you've said before, a lot of this has to do with drug laws or other um, policies that our government has. And if they stop protecting us from the harsh reality of, you know, what that's caused to people in these countries, maybe we'll actually make the necessary changes as opposed to just pretending like that's what they're really trying to do. They just want to pretend like everything's under control and it's completely fine. And they'll let the mess escalate as much as it can and hope that if it, you know, if, when the cards come down, it's a big enough problem that they can either print us out of it or, you know what I mean? The, the government's in the game of really big messes, because if there's really big messes, then there's panic and they can either just send the military out and go, well, we got to prevent, you know, all this yeah. panic or they can, you know what I mean? It, but that's not, that's not, no one's winning. It's, this isn't a winning strategy to pretend like things are fine. And that, and this is such a transparent version of that where Biden literally does not want the pictures to come out where people can to see, no, this is a harsh situation. We actually do need to make some decisions here because this is not a working, you know, this doesn't, yeah. this doesn't work. And, and I think the thing that's scary to, to the Biden administration about this is that as I, I was making this point a, a couple episodes ago, but that you have, you know, what, what are dubbed the useful idiots, right? In many cases are true believers. Um, and, and so you have all of these people, right? Who were whipped up into a frenzy about Donald Trump's immigration policies and kids in cages and all this stuff, you know? And a lot of them really believe that stuff. And, and 
understandably, you know, it's it's horrible that any child would be in in you know a prison essentially. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of these people are very upset over that. And it's not so easy to just get them all to turn that off. I mean, a, a certain amount of them will be, they can be propagandized into like, you know, only hating the other side. But I think that Biden is pretty uh, concerned that if these images came out, like, yeah, a lot of his more progressive base, which he's already shaky with. I mean, most of those progressives only supported Joe Biden because they hated Donald Trump so much. And Trump's gone. I mean, they keep they can keep mentioning him, but he's gone. He's not even on Twitter anymore. You know, they don't have him to kick around the way they used to. And so now I think he's they're pretty concerned that if these if these images come out, um, you know, it's a uh, it's yeah. They might him. go, wow, this is incredibly immoral. Maybe we actually need to make the societal investment in a wall so that people don't try and cross in here because look at the immorality it's causing. Or Stated differently, how do we just let these people in? Well, then we got to get rid of government benefits for the people that live here because we can't both have government benefits and infinite people coming into the country. So we, we put it back to you, poor people of America. Do you want to be immoral and not let people come here and have free and equal opportunity? Or do you want to give up your benefits so that we can do that and now you're going to have to compete with them? These are choices that people have to make. I yeah. prefer just the open borders, no benefit thing. You know, I, I'm, I'm confident in my skill set. And I, I think uh, labor's uh, creates more opportunity, but that's not that's not the decision other people want to make. Right. Well, it does. It seems like with the current um, immigration system, we really almost have the worst of all worlds, like just on a on a humanitarian level and on a practical level. You know, like if, if theoretically, like you had just you know, a, a completely controlled immigration system or highly restricted or limited immigration system. Like if there were walls and you know what I mean? Like there were, it's just something that would actually crack down on, there was no illegal immigration. It was just not possible, you know, like, like Israel has or something like that, you know, like where it's like, are these, these big walls, you're not getting in there. Like illegal immigrants are not getting into Israel, you know? And if you had that type of situation, um, in, in America, uh, there's problems associated with it. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm an, I'm an anarchist. I don't believe in government doing anything. Um, and there's it, it's uh, it's wrong that if somebody wanted to invite their cousin to come live with them from another country, they wouldn't be able to do it. Or if there was somebody, you know, it, it would certainly have economic uh, negative effects that labor couldn't move as freely, you know, um, and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, you wouldn't have this. You wouldn't have fucking people being rounded up and held in these facilities. You wouldn't have people making this like incredibly dangerous journey and dying and being assaulted and raped on the way and all of this stuff, you know, it seems like this is worse on, on just that humanitarian level. And it seems like you, you get this thing where you have like the worst of both worlds under the current system where you have this incredibly, you know, it's like we subsidize immigration um, uh, through amnesty and welfare and pathway to citizenship. And then we have to also subsidize the war against immigration and build up this huge, you know, like police state, uh, um, you have to rob, you know, the, all the eminent domain violations on the border. And then you have to like have all of these like constitutional violations in the in the border zone, you know, which extends like crazy far into America, where they basically just repeal the Constitution in these areas and kind of create this little mini show me your papers state. So you have this incredibly what we have right now is this incredibly um, like uh, um, aggressive, uh, tyrannical border patrol that still doesn't stop illegal immigrants from getting into the country. Like what, who is that working for? It, it, probably, it, uh... like, you make all of these sacrifices, you know what I mean? In uh, like morally, economically, uh, um, in terms of your liberties, you make all of these sacrifices and you still have people flooding into the country at record numbers over the last, you know, decade or whatever. It, it's like, so what, what is this? We don't, it's not even like, oh man, we're creating this, this humanitarian nightmare, but at least it's preventing this other humanitarian nightmare or, or something like that. It's just, it doesn't even prevent anything. It's, it's just, this whole system is, is, uh, it just seems like the worst of all worlds. And how can the Democrats possibly pretend like they aren't motivating it when they call them, they call the kids that come in dreamers, 
So like, the, you know, welcome. You you guys are a dreamer. We like what you're doing. You're, you're wishing to live a better life. And they just gave, I think, two million of them a pathway to citizenship. Yeah. So if you're if you're a kid, a little little Mexican, you're seven years old, that's got to be the bravest thing you can do is pick up and go become a dreamer and possibly live a better life in America. And and this has been the um, the argument from a lot of the right wing uh, border hawk types, the, the Pat Buchanan's of the world has been their argument for a long time that the amnesty encourages more uh, immigrants to come which is does make sense and does seem to be the case. And this was their big criticism of Ronald Reagan's amnesty, that once you do that, then you're going to get millions more coming in. And so to give, you know, um, to, to give two million dreamers, the dreamers of, you know, of course, kind of propagandistic term, but the dreamers are the kids who basically came, you know, um, into the country as children could be from could be a baby could be they were 17 years old, but they came here as children. And I, I got to say, I mean, I, I'm kind of like, like, I certainly I, I don't want to deport dreamers. I, I don't know. It's like, I, if somebody came here at two years old, and has grown up here their entire life, I think it's pretty fucked up. Well, to here's like another tough force decision. them back to their country. But if you do this, you do have to accept that this is going to send like a wink and a nod to a lot of people that if you can get your kids here, you're you're they're going to be in. And then you incentivize sending a lot more kids here. And, and for obvious humanitarian reasons, I don't want to see that. Um, sneaking in, we could just say you're breaking the law. Now, we can choose to have laws or not law. You know what I mean? You can. The, the point of laws is you can rewrite them. But it, the I guess the condition, not the si society that you and I go for, but the framework of democracy is that we're going to decide on having certain laws and then we're going to enforce those laws. If you break a law, that's the outset of you being here is that you're so then you're not willing to contribute to that system. You're going to take from that system and go, I don't believe in the construct of this. Right. I'm taking from it. I'm breaking the law. It's not it shouldn't be any different than stealing. You can you can choose right to have a law of theft or not have a law of theft. You can choose to have a law of sneaking in, not sneaking in. You can choose to have a law about not breaking your nose. But if a group of people are getting together and saying, I'm saying for the for the society construct to work. So in this case, when a person's sneaking in, they're breaking the law and people, let's say in states such as Texas go, I don't agree with it. I think it's unfair for those people to then be given the right to vote. Well, it's, so a, funny, think, it's a funny thing, right? Like there's something really just uh, uh, hilarious about the aspect where you'll have these like politicians who write these laws. The law is on the book that this is illegal. And then when there's a citizen who goes, I want you to enforce that law, they're like, you racist. What, <laughs> right. who, you can what have type it, of monster would want you want us to enforce the laws that we You can wrote? have it either way. So you can say that it's not a law and it's not a value of society. And then that's the way that you do it. You, you, you know what I mean? You can't have it both ways. Um, and so I would think the tough decision to then be made would go, listen, we're all in agreement. We, we kind of morally don't want to throw these people out. Maybe we do need to have a second class citizenship in this country where these people will not be able to vote. Their kids won't be able to vote. They can live here and pay taxes. And what's interesting is there's still a choice there that those people can choose. You know what? That's not better for me than going to Mexico or voting. Or they might choose, hey, actually, I prefer to live here as a second class citizen. The problem, this goes back to what I was saying before, if people like to live in this dream world where there are no consequences, is that everyone doesn't like the idea of a second class citizen like th th that seems immoral. How do I have a second class citizen? That's not right. So I'm I'm, I'm for, like this person's worse than I am. Well, what's the alternative? The alternative is you're basically stealing from people in Texas who don't want to live in that construct where this person gets to vote. Yeah. I, Just no, getting you're, back you're, to what I'm saying of you have to actually start looking at some of the consequences of these things and deciding to make the decisions. Well, I had uh, this, um, not, not exactly a debate, but I, uh, this is uh, last year at some point I had um, Jen, the libertarian on the show, and, and she was basically, um, I, if I remember correctly, I don't want to misrepresent what she said, so whatever, because um, I just don't remember that well. Um, but I've, I've heard this from a lot of libertarians where they'll basically say, well, I'm for open borders, but not for citizenship, right? And I think part of that is because they see the problems of of open borders with just automatic citizenship right and they see the problems with open borders mixed with voting and welfare and all of these things so you they'll take that position to kind of solve the uh contradiction internally 
And my follow up to that always was because, you know, it's like, like my big thing with libertarianism in general, and I think this is where libertarians sometimes get goofy and um, make themselves irrelevant, is when you're just living in your head and not applying it to real life. And that's what's important is what can be applied to real life. That's all that really matters. Everything else is just a waste of time. Um, so what I'd, I'd ask, and, and my follow up to that is I go, oh, okay, so now how do you enforce that? So if you're saying like, oh, we want to have open borders, but they can't vote. Okay. How? So, so you're for strict voter ID in all uh, elections. And you have to be for some type of ID that can't be easily forged, right? Because like the current system that we have in so many, as we were covering a few episodes ago, the Democrats proposed voting overhaul is like basically no restrictions on any of that or no, you know, no enforcement of the restrictions. I guess you have to say, yes, I'm a citizen or something like that, but no, there's no, you know, enforcement of it. Um, so it's like that's now now you have this whole you know uh, problem. Like how are you gonna how are you gonna actually enforce that they're not voting, they're not on welfare, all of these things? Because that's because now the problem right in this libertarian mo worldview where you want to be kind of perfect and libertarian and consistent, which I understand, it's what we all want. Um, but now you go, but now you're almost requiring by your own proposal a state that's going to enforce these distinctions. So how are we going to enforce that welfare isn't being received or that voting isn't being uh, votes aren't being casted, you know, and so it's not it's just not as simple uh, in real life as is as it is often uh, presented It's just there's there's a lot more uh, um, there's a lot more complicated moving pieces, I think, involved. And, and the other thing that's uh, I think, you know, a really complicated part of it is the is the cultural aspects, which many times I think uh, people underestimate and that you go like so you know there are um despite how far america has come on the kind of racial front there are still so many racial tensions and you have this thing where like th there's a whole apparatus of the kind of progressive establishment that exists as we've been talking about this episode to stoke racial tensions you know so you're going to have, you know, it, you're going to have a ton of that. You're going to have reaction, uh, uh, reactionary right winger types. It's like, I don't know. You paint me a picture under today's like uh, uh, American society, the way it is with the welfare state and with voting and with all of these things where just we have open borders and this doesn't result in just, you know, like a, a, a nightmare. And, and I don't I don't see it, you know, and, and you can have as many like flow charts or libertarian equations on a piece of paper that say it'll improve the economy. But we're dealing with human beings here. And I just I don't see this working out well, um, which is why my my approach has always been, you know, it's like, hey, here's what we need to do to solve the immigration problem is end the war on drugs and end the welfare state. And uh, th that's like the best thing we could do to actually try to, to, to try to move us away from this current situation where we have the worst of all worlds and move us towards something that is better than that. Um, so anyway, I still push that. All right, we got to wrap up. Uh, don't forget, come to Porkfest. Me and Robbie the Fire Bernstein will both be at Porkfest. I will be at Freedom Fest. Rob will be at Childeberg. Follow Rob's podcast. Uh, go, go listen to it. It's fantastic. It's called Run Your Mouth. And follow Robbie on Twitter at Robbie the Fire. Thanks for listening. Peace.